Rachel, I suppose whenever you are ready, uh, we can go ahead. <laughs> Great, I think I am ready, so let's begin. Welcome everyone, it's a great delight to welcome you to this Five Talents panel discussion on the climate crisis this morning. And it's a particular delight to welcome our distinguished panel of speakers. In a few moments, I will ask them to introduce themselves and then we'll have some structured Q&A. And then as Megan said, it will be your turn to ask them all your questions. But before we get onto that, let me just set the scene as to why Five Talents has organized this uh, panel discussion on the climate crisis. Of course, climate is all over the media at the moment with COP26 beginning next week, but we at Five Talents see three glaring omissions from much of the coverage that we want to address today. And the first of those is that the climate crisis is very rarely presented in our media as an issue of injustice, inequity. You might have heard David Attenborough earlier this week being interviewed saying there is a moral obligation for the wealthier nations to support the poorer nations who are feeling most of the impacts of climate change, even though wealthier nations caused much of the climate change. Um, so David Attenborough was framing it as a moral issue, but we very rarely hear it framed in those terms. And yet, let me show you a couple of graphs from Oxfam, which show very, very clearly that it is the wealthier nations who have caused much of uh, the climate crisis that we're experiencing. This graph here, which hopefully you can now all see, if you look at the bottom dark green band of colour there, the one labelled 7%, that is showing us that the poorest 50% of the global population are contributing just 7% of cumulative emissions, carbon emissions from 1990 to 2015. So the world's 50% poorest population are contributing just 7% of total emissions. And then if you look at the black and the grey uh, blocks at the top of the graph, that represents the 10% of the richest people, the, the richest, the 10% of the world's population who are the richest, and they're contributing 52% of global emissions. So there's a clear, there's a clear justice issue here. Half the world, the poorest half, are contributing 7% of carbon emissions, and yet the richest 10% of the world are contributing 52% of global emissions. And the next graph uh, paints a similar picture. On this one, you need to look at the horizontal black line towards the bottom of the graph. That represents the amount of carbon that we should all be emitting to remain. We need to be below that line to remain under the one and a half degree of global heating that we know we need to keep within. That's one of the key outputs that COP26 needs to meet is that to, to find us all targets so that we emit carbon below that one and a half degree target. Now, the small black squares on this graph represent per capita consumption leading to emissions. So you can see on the right hand side, the little black square in the poorest 50 percent box that shows that the poorest 50 percent of the world's population are consuming at a rate that keeps global warming below that one and a half degree maximum. But then over on the left of the graph, you can see the richest 1%, the little black box in the top left of the graph, way off the scale. The richest 10% also consuming way more, way, way, way above that black line. So that shows very clearly there's a, a huge imperative for the richest 10% to tackle their consumption, to tackle climate change. We rarely hear climate change presented as an issue of justice. We know from our Five Talents programmes that our members, members of our programmes in the poorer countries are not contributing to carbon emissions. They do not get on aeroplanes. They do not own cars. If they use electronic devices, they probably have a solar panel to charge them, one phone, one lamp. We know that their lifestyles are not emitting carbon at the rates that the richer nations are. And yet we know also that they are experiencing the, the, the effects of climate change firsthand. And that's the second emission that we see. We rarely hear on our media the stories of people in poorer countries who are experiencing climate change. You remember way back before the pandemic, before the pandemic knocked everything else off the news cycle, we read a lot about the wildfires, the awful wildfires in Australia. Earlier this year, we heard in our news about the awful flooding in Germany. We do hear about hurricanes in the US, but we rarely hear about adverse weather events uh, from the rest of the world. And we at Five Talents hear about them all the time from our partners. Right now, we're hearing from our partners in northern Kenya that they are suffering food shortages because of drought. This map from the UN shows the orange blocks show areas of Kenya which are in an emergency or crisis status uh, because of the drought. You can see a large part of Kenya is currently affected 
affected. At the very same time, in South Sudan, 466,000 people have been affected by flooding. That's nearly half a million people affected by flooding in South Sudan. And in Uganda, where we work, we work in the northeast of Uganda, actually the parts shaded orange and yellow, but here orange and yellow again means food insecurity in a stressed or crisis state. And that's not because of drought or flooding actually, but because of erratic rainfall affecting the crops, meaning there is crop failure and food shortages. These impacts of climate change, we rarely hear on our news cycle. And we at Five Talents think that there should be much more prominence given to the impacts of climate change suffered by the people who are, are not causing it. And then the third omission we see is that we very rarely hear from experts from the countries where Five Talents works, the countries experiencing climate change. I'm sure we all love David Attenborough, as all right-minded people do. We could probably listen to him all day long, but we shouldn't just be hearing from him. There are other environmental activists, environmental experts. And that's why we're absolutely delighted today to bring you three of them who are going to uh, share with us a little bit about their work. So let me ask them now to introduce themselves and then we'll move on to Q&A. Claire, perhaps you can go first with the introductions. Thank you so much, Rachel. My name is Claire Nasike. I work as a food campaigner at Greenpeace Africa. My role basically entails working with farmers on agroecology as a mitigative um, strategy towards the climate crisis. Thank you, Claire. Jackie, how about you? Okay, my name is Jackie Yopar. I'm the, I'm the regional deputy editor for Side the Planet. Side is a media platform that focuses on science and development stories, especially stories that has to do with countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, so that we are given a platform for group scientists, researchers in both the global south and global north to come together and help also make policy help influence policy making in these countries. Thanks, Jackie. Your connection, sadly, is not quite so good, so we might need to ask you to turn your video off to make sure we can hear you clearly. Um, but let's move on now to Philip, if you could introduce yourself. All right. How are you guys? Uh, this is Philip McLeod. Sorry, uh, I came late, one, because I happen to be in a the event that I told you at uh, the University of Eldoret, uh, that was in Gishu County. So I happen to be the Team Environment Kenya CEO, and uh, it's amazing. We do environmental conservation and awareness and CSR program. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Great. Well, let's begin. I have a question for all three of you. Um, I'll ask Philip to answer it first, as we've got you on the screen right now. But if you could all share, what are the impacts of climate change where you are, where you work? What does it look like from where you're standing? Um, I will answer that question via my own life experience. When I was around five years old, we had plenty of food. We had clean water. We had a lot of cattle all over the country we had lesser sicknesses and right now it is the opposite opposite totally we have dry spaces i remember last time i showed you how the place was so dry the grass was uh, was literally brown but as you can see around here it's a different scenario just allow me to bring this in the meeting these are the trees you can see here environment has been conserved and we have green grass so what i'm trying to say some of the parts of the country as you say you've said we are really suffering and struggling. So they are very adverse to the extent that our people are dying without necessarily knowing it's the impact of the climate crisis change. Yeah. Thanks, Philip. Um, Claire, let's turn to you. How is climate change looking where you are? Thank you so much, Rachel, for that question. Um, in terms of the climate crisis and, and where I work, particularly with smallholder farmers in the eastern region of, of Kenya, these farmers have really been impacted by the climate crisis in the sense that um, there's been varying weather patterns. You find that the rainfall seasons have changed. So when the rainfall seasons change, it affects how these farmers grow their food. And that eventually also affects the availability of food. So whatever food is available is very minimal for consumption and for sale. So you find that these farmers are only able to harvest what is enough for their own consumption, but not for sale. And that leads to situations of food insecurity. 
and it doesn't end there. There's also been cases of, you know, uh, prolonged droughts. And if there are prolonged droughts, obviously it's gonna affect food productivity. But then there's also the lack of water. The Eastern region is categorized, uh, the Eastern region of Kenya is categorized as, as a semi-arid and arid region. So the extended long droughts have had an impact whereby these local farmers and local communities have had to work for longer distances to look for water some of them have had to look for other ways such as you know digging up the riverbeds the sand from the riverbeds in a, in order for them to be able to find water for their cattle to find water for them to to irrigate the crops that the little crops that have managed to grow so they've really been farming communities have really been affected by the impact of of a climate crisis thank you claire and jackie over to you so, um, I, I live in Lagos, Nigeria, and what we have seen is that the, 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 weather, the weather events are coming even this weekend and it's taking a toll on the health of members in the community. We have seen more cases of disease caused by air pollution, foodborne diseases, waterborne diseases. The community centers are overcrowded as a result of this, and even health workers are lacking tools, and now they are not feeling even more even secure to do their job because they are drained because of overworking. There are no tools for them to work. People are coming to the hospitals and there's not enough space for them to take care of them. So if it has it has come to a commercial stage, maybe thank God the cook, the cook, we are having this this cook event coming up next week. It is really serious because I feel that the, the health crisis on climate change is not being in the front runner. It is more on other issues because I don't know what you will do with that health. It is it's so bad that we don't, the doctors are moving away in droves. They don't have job satisfaction. They are taking so working longer hours and people are dying aimlessly for diseases that it could take them an hour to get well. And if these things were avoided, it wouldn't happen in the first place. So that's the situation here, especially in these communities in Lagos and in the southwest of our country. The health impact is really getting to the commercial state and a lot of things need to be done urgently. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So let me ask each of you in turn now what you hope to achieve through your work, what your work does and what you hope to achieve from it. Um, Claire, let's go to you first this time. Thank you so much for that question, Rachel. I think for us, what we hope to achieve is to make sure that farmers um, are adapting to the impacts of, of a climate crisis. And how we do that is through agroecology. We are training these farmers on, on agroecology. And for those ones who are on this call and probably don't understand what agroecology means in simple terms, agroecology is sustainable farming in line with nature. So you are not ruining the existing natural reserves or natural resources that exist. So we already know that we have prolonged periods of drought, we have scarce rainfall, but we do not also want to destroy the remaining resources that are critical in food production, that are critical in the well-being of, of communities that are critical in the sustenance of communities. So we are training local communities and particularly smallholder farmers on agroecology. How then can they use indigenous seeds that are acclimatized the local weather conditions um, to grow food? Indigenous seeds require minimal water as opposed to hybrids and GMOs. So they're not worried about a lot of using a lot of water when growing this food. We already know there's there's a shortage of water because of the prolonged droughts. Um, aside from that, what are some of the ways in which they can harvest water? What are the practices such as you know, zypeats that they can employ on their farms to be able to grow at, at least minimum food for their own ho households? Aside from that, how do they enrich the soil? We know that soil stores a lot of carbon in it, more than the carbon stored in, in trees. So how do they enrich the soils and at the same time conserve the carbon in the in this soil? So we are, we're training these communities on, on agroecology. How do we adapt to, to the crisis at the moment? How can communities then sustain themselves alongside the climate crisis? 
Thank you. And um, Philip, over to you. Tell us about your work and what you hope to achieve through it. All right. Mm -hmm. Our work is, uh, as I said, is more of conservation mm -hmm. and creating awareness. And uh, conservation in matters of uh, going back to where we used to be environmentally, where we used to have more indigenous trees, which supposed to supply food for insects, food for animals, food for human beings, shed and a home for that habitat for the for the entire you know you know animals and human beings. So our work is to retain them and go back there and also creating awareness in the name of uh, creating a generation that is going to embrace the reality on the ground. A few minutes ago before I joined you, sorry, I talked to those students and told them it's a matter of taking it at heart and enjoying doing conservation. Because here when you mention conservation, tree planting, people think it's a, it's a blue job, it's a blue collar job, it's a dirty job, that's not their thing, you know? So we are trying to bring the culture of embracing conservation, feeling good about it and thinking about the future generation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Philip. Um, Jackie, over to you again. All right, so for us, what we're actually doing is prioritizing stories. Can, can you hear me well? Can you hear me well? It's not that clear. Um, I think the internet is a little bit struggling, but we can just about hear you, so do carry on. Okay, so what we are actually doing is we are prioritizing stories to influence policies to help fight climate change. We are engaging with policymakers regularly so they take more action and less stop, especially in the reduction of carbon emissions. And most importantly, we are educating and helping communities adapt to a changing climate. That is one of the reasons we began the African Science Focus podcast to give a platform for ordinary people to discuss with scientists, researchers, and policymakers. We believe that if we have a common platform where they meet and discuss their issues, the policymakers understand understand them more and it leads more into action when they hear from the horses mad. We just don't want to be a platform where we just strike and that's it. We also have a full we also have follow-up issue um, follow-ups like we have a WhatsApp group. We collect numbers of these people and merge them together so that the discussion just doesn't just end there. We have follow-up discussions on what to do and follow up on what have we done, what is going to be done next just to make sure that the conversation, we keep on talking about these things and make it a full bona issue in our publication at all times. There is no week on a platform that we don't discuss climate change, not only on health impacts of climate change, on various impacts of climate change. We make sure that we make it a full bona every other week. We are discussing, we are interviewing researchers, we are interviewing even smallholder farmers, we are interviewing health workers on the things they require to make sure that they are able to adapt smoothly to the ever changing climate. And Jackie, you mentioned in your introduction about the health impacts of climate change. Tell us a little bit more about that, if you would. Okay. So um, I, I'll just start by giving some key facts from WHO on how climate is impacting health. But like we said, climate change affects not the social, environmental, and determinants of health. A clear air, safe drinking water, sufficient food, and secure shelter. And it says that between 2030 and 2050, the climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year from malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, and food stress. And the direct damage cost, the direct damage cost of health, excluding protein, you know, health damaging factor like agriculture and water you know, sanitation, is estimated to be between USD $2.4 million billion every year by 2030. So we are in a very precarious situation. We just can't fold our hands and think that we will continue discussions and not take action. So, you know, the health, if, the health effect of these kind of disruptions, which are even includes respiratory and cardiovascular diseases, injuries, premature death, is related to extreme weather events. And recently, an open letter was signed by more than 450 organizations representing 45 million health workers and we called on the national leaders and country delegations at COP26 or in Glasgow next week to put human health and equity at the center 
of climate change mitigation and our control actions. The list of the signatories represent more than two thirds of the global health efforts, according to the World, the World Health Organization. We publish this story on our site. I'll share the link for everyone so that you can read it and understand more and see the content of the letter. Because we are also covering the ongoing Glasgow, we have we are doing a live event in order so that people that are not able to go there can come to our website and see it live as it's happening and listen to the discussions and participate and send the questions because we are reporters that are already there and send the questions that are affecting them what they want to achieve from the the, the conference. So I mean, it, it, I think that a lot of things need to be done if these climate issues are hot topics. In order to continue, well, we have to continue to raise awareness on the need to prioritize investments in climate policies and measures that can provide benefits for health and equity. I mean, we, we just can't keep talking and not take action. That's, that's just, just like you said, people in low and mid, medium income countries are being affected mostly. And we need to really prioritize their need and make sure that this goes from talk to action. Absolutely. Um, not just talk, more action very much needed. It's also a, a great reminder that the impacts of climate change are, you know, they are holistic. Health impacts are a massive part of that. Um, so thank you for that, Jackie. Um, Philip, you mentioned that you've just been talking to some students. and Tell us more about how the climate crisis is particularly affecting younger people. Um, it is affecting them both directly and indirectly. Indirectly in the manner of uh, they have no idea what is happening, no one is talking about it, they are not even taught. Directly is when now they lose their parents to some of the crises, as you mentioned, uh, for instance, a fire outbreak uh, in Australia, as you mentioned, hurricanes in the USA. There are kids who have become orphans because of the climate crisis uh, issues all over the planet and uh, including even here in Africa in one way or the other. So when I was talking to these students, I was reminding them it's a responsibility that has to be taken at heart, at heart in the name of uh, enjoying, loving and feeling, being passionate about conserving for the future, future generation, live alone about children of our children, the future, future generation, even after 100 years to come. And I, ha I asked one of them, uh, one of the trees here, like how, how old do you think this tree is? And the, the student just said it might be like five years old. The tree is almost 30 years old, 20 years old. It means they don't know. So we need to come out and embrace it. Tell them like, uh, you need to be part of this. You need to be part of this. They enjoy it on daily basis, whether in urban or rural. And then it's gonna be a culture all over the world. And uh, I really need to thank uh, Five Talents for this wonderful program because we have started on the right note, on the right footing, because we need to talk and then act upon it. So what we're doing is very, very nice. And I'm passionate, as I said again, talk to your children, let them know about this. Not like it's just for grown-ups. you can come for Zoom meeting and then it's done. Megan, talk to your siblings, talk to your young ones. And uh, let's do this, Toyosi, Ario, let's do this. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, Philip. Um, I think here often we find it's a case of the children talking to the parents about climate change as well. I think another dimension of, of the injustice element of climate change is that it is that the people who are consuming now are affecting the climate, the planet for the future. So I think there's an intergenerational uh, justice element as well. But you give us some hope, Philip, that um, younger people are taking action, um, not just talking. Claire, it was great to hear you talk a little bit about your work with uh, smallholder farmers. Many of the Five Talents members are, of course, engaged in agriculture. Many of them are at the subsistence level. Could you tell us a little bit about more about your work with smallholder farmers um, and the, the climate change impacts on that? Thank you so much, uh, Rachel, for that question. I think when it comes to smallholder farmers, it's important to understand that 80% of the food consumed in the world today is produced by smallholder farmers. Yet uh, these smallholder farmers are continuously affected by the impacts of climate crisis, and they have little contribution to it. They do not have massive um, oil wealth, 
they are not at the center of, of, of pipelines, they are not involved in gas projects, but now when it comes to the impacts of climate crisis, they are the ones feeling it the most. And it's it's been a challenge, you know, listening to communities tell you um, how they used to have enough rainfall, but the rainfall is no more, how they are struggling with food production and not just food production, they're also struggling to sustain their livelihoods, educate their children, because for most of them, farming is their source of livelihood. This is where, this is their bread and butter. They get money from it to educate their children, take care of their homes, take care of you know their families and, and everything. So when they are affected by something that they have little contribution to, you, one is actually compelled to speak up, compelled to give them alternatives because they do not understand what is happening. And so for us scientists who understand what is happening, it's critical to help them understand this is what is happening. But as, as much as this is what is happening, what are the solutions? What can we do? to live with what is happening now, which is the impact of the climate crisis. What can those farmers do to live with those impacts? Yes, we understand they're contributing little to it. And they are not even involved in some of this uh, decision-making. Like right now, COP26 is, is happening soon, in a week or so, but these farmers are not involved in that. They're not involved in these high level panel meetings that are normally carried out. Recently, we had the UN Food System Summit how many smallholder farmers took part in it? Very few of them. You find that it was just, you know, the big shots um, who were involved, those representatives from governments, from AGRA, from all the civil society organizations, but the people who are actually feeling the pinch of the climate crisis were left behind. And that's why it's important that in our area of work, we get them informed. We let them know what are, what are the steps they can take, what are the solutions they can take, and what are the possible areas in which they can raise their voices. It's not just about them, you know, growing food, but how can they raise their voices as well? How can they have their voices heard when it comes to this con a conversation around the climate crisis? Because they are living with the impacts. They are faced by those impacts every day. And how can they raise their voices? Tell us, tell us how can they get their voices heard? Hmm. They can have their voices heard through various farmer movements. Um, for instance, we have movements such as the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in, in Africa, which brings together about 150,000 farmers, I believe, or more, that actually speak towards the solution that they want, the solutions that work for them on the ground, not the solutions that are you know, portrayed on paper and are not uh, working for them. So being part of such kind of movements, we've got um, La Via Campesina. Those are movements that farmers can be part of. And these movements have representatives who attend this COP, COP events or who attend this food system summit or any other high level or discussions that are around the climate crisis. So farmers can get represented through that. And getting them informed, which is something that Greenpeace Africa is doing, getting them informed, letting them know that these are the policies in place. This is what is happening across the world. Because most of the time, the, the, the language used is, I term it scientific jargon for these farmers to understand. So it's critical for organizations such as Greenpeace to break it down for them. We do that. We help them understand what is climate crisis in their own language. You know, we tell them the climate crisis and we expect them to tell us how it's affecting them because they, they'll tell us something like, oh, you know, there's no rain nowadays, although the heat is too much. And so it's upon us to connect what they're telling us to the scientific information that we have, and then link them to the necessary groups, to the necessary advocacy organizations or civil society organizations that are speaking up for their rights, that are speaking up for the rights of these communities. And it's just not about farmers alone. We're talking about indigenous communities that reside in forests, such as the Congo Basin forests, you know, that has a lot of um, issues on on illegal logging. Some of these communities are being chased out of out of their 
of their ancestral land, which is within which is which is within this forest, and they used to conserve this forest. But then now we have foreign investments that are geared towards this, towards our logging in this forest, and these communities are being displaced. So it's critical that they are aware what are some of these routes or channels that they can follow and where can they get information? What organizations can help them in advocating for their rights? Yes, they're suffering from the impacts of the climate crisis, but they have minimal contribution towards the climate crisis. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for all three speakers, uh, but we'll start with Claire as we still have you on our screen. Tell us what are your hopes and fears for the COP26 uh, beginning next week? I will start with my fears because I like to start with the bad news first and then I go to the good news. So my fear is that COP26 is just going to be like, you know, one of those COP meetings that we normally have. Um, everybody is looking busy and we have all these discussions going on and countries are bringing forth their national determined contributions or the plans, but nothing happens, you know. We're all looking busy in our so and carrying our folders and everything, but nothing happens at the end of it. The hope that I have from COP26 is that there's going to be a global phase out of fossil fuels. And by fossil fuels, I mean no, no new oil wells. We don't need any more pipelines. We don't need any more gas projects. Like for instance, right now in, in the East African region, we have the East African crude oil project that has been proposed. So why are we still looking at investments in crude oil when we have other alternatives such as renewable energy? We've got solar, we've got wind. Why can't we channel our, our investments in that? So one of my hopes that, that, I will, that I am actually holding on to is that some of these projects that are being initiated will be put to a stop and we will try and, and phase out completely fossil fuels. The other hope I have is that we will minimize foreign investments in, in deforestation, in illegal logging, in, in land grabbing. And I say minimal foreign investments in this is because most of these investments, particularly in Africa and in fossil fuels, we had the coal project in Kenya that was put to a stop, the Lamu coal plant. Lamu is a pristine island, yet there was this um, proposal, uh, or what is it called? There was this idea that um, we can have a coal plant in Lamu. Lamu is a UNESCO World Heritage Site, but we have investments coming from some of these developed countries wanting to invest in fossil fuels in Africa, and not just fossil fuels, investments in illegal logging look at what is happening in the in the drc the second largest rainforest in the world but we have investments that are actually keen to cut down some of the oldest trees in the world investments that are actually keen to make sure that communities indigenous communities such as the local lama in, in, in the Congo Basin forests are evicted from their homes. Land grabbing, these investments are keen to see that smallholder farmers let go of their lands and these lands are actually leased for industrial agricultural practices. And what does this lead to? This industrial agricultural practices, most of them, they lead to the destruction of soil. I just mentioned initially that soil is very critical in holding carbon. So if you're going to have investments in industrial agriculture, that means we're going to use a lot of, of chemical fertilizers and we know chemical fertilizers emanate from fossil fuels. Then what are we doing? We are just increasing our carbon emissions. We are increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. And this is likely to raise the temperatures. Right now we're, we're saying that we are, be, we are actually not where we're supposed to be in terms of the Paris Climate Agreement. There was an agreement of countries minimizing the, the, the emissions to 1.5 degrees centigrade, but we are above that at the moment and countries are not putting in any plans that, that well, the plans are there, but there's no implementation whatsoever to actually make sure that these plans go towards minimizing 
um, greenhouse gas emissions that are related to the climate crisis. So my hope is that from the discussions at COP26, we can phase out fossil fuels, no investments in projects that are destructive to the environment, illegal logging, deforestation, um, industrial agriculture and, and fossil fuels. Thank you. Um, Philip, tell us your hopes and fears for COP26. My fears is um, we've had so much PR done over the years, over and over, even before. Personally, I started taking this matter at hand and seriously. So I, 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 I can remember one of our former prime minister, Raila Odinga, talking of Kyoto Protocol, which was discussed, I think it's in Russia or Paris, I can't remember well. But I'm afraid it has been done and done and done again and again, but there's no much being done. But uh, my hope is uh, it's coming down to, to Megan, it's coming down to Rachel, Jackie, and normal people. By the way, am I still the only boy child in the house? I'm loving it because uh, <laughs> it is coming to the normal person, the normal uh, uh, citizen taking an initiative. So the hope is if you're going to take it in our own hands and continue uniting like this, regardless of our skin color, regardless of our education background, regardless of our races, we can do something better together. That's my hope. And I have, I believe with this spirit, we can go far. Five talents, keep up, wake them up. Let UNEP know it can be done. They need just hope we can do this together. Thank you so much. Thank you, Philip. Um, you are the only boy or child on the panel. So thank you for representing them too. Um, Jackie, over to you. What are your hopes and fears for COP? Yes. Okay. Let, let, just like Claire said, I was telling some colleagues of mine that I've attended so much conferences that if I go for one, I could do a new story without even going for one because I already know the things they would say. It's always this big English, big talk about what's going to be done. But when it comes to the business, nothing is done. It could even say some NGOs that participate and they are doing fun to do some certain things. You see embezzlement. Like, I, I'm like it's, there's so much that could have been done over the years if they actually wanted to do it. Instead of spending so much money doing a conference and nothing to come out. So hopefully, I can see that this COP26 is looking good because a lot of people are now very aware of the dangers of climate change because it is astronomically getting getting so bad that it can never it cannot be ignored anymore. So um, I believe that this time around there will be action and with the with the health workers writing like 450,000 health workers writing this an open letter. I think that people are now more aware of the dangers of climate change because now, even if it's, if it's affecting everyone, nobody is left out. Nobody, even if you think that it's affecting the low, the poorer countries, but the, the richer countries are also feeling the bond now. So it is, I, I just believe that there is more awareness and this one will just be talk and talk and talk. Thank you. And my last question for all three panelists is to ask you to share with us some of the best solutions or the best adaptations you have seen through your work to climate change. So Jackie, let's start with you. Tell us about some of the best solutions or adaptations that you've seen. Okay, so for me, because I'm in the media, the best solution I've seen, and I've seen that it works because of my experiment with the African Science Podcast, we have seen like we have seen talk actualize into action because if you continue to raise awareness by providing helpful information, disseminating this information on the threats that climate change presents to the human health, it, 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 you know, it goes into your subconscious sense because even the weather, weather pattern is changing, is the, it is clear what climate change is doing. So when we continue to raise this awareness and not stop talking, you know, gradually, we've seen change coming gradually. And you know, implementation, we, we, don't, we don't only want to talk, we want to support, we want to create, you know, continue talking about implementation of public health response to climate change to assist these countries in building capacity to 
to reduce health vulnerabilities to climate change, to promote health while reducing carbon emissions. There's a lot to do, partnership, coordinate and partner with other NGOs from, from the poorer countries to work with them. Into, even if it means travels and all that, we need to coordinate and work with these NGOs to make sure that you know the agenda, the health is properly, properly represented in the climate change agenda. I'm no, sorry, I'm, I'm just hamping on health because I mean, people are dying of, and we are just ignoring it. People die of common cold. I mean, it's because it's not as if they can be here, but there are too many, so many people for little hands. I mean, doctors are migrating to countries that will pay them better. Every day, they are my doctors leaving the poorer countries to get a better life. But, I mean, you wouldn't blame them. They also have to take care of themselves. There's a lot going on. You see a lot of people going, doing, using, using um, traditional health without knowing the implication of what they are taking. So it is, I think that awareness is very important. It helps, you can't stop talking about it. You can't stop talking about it. And the partnership, we just, we, we need to continuously coordinate with NGOs, partner agencies, stakeholders in low and medium income countries to ensure, continue to ensure that, you know, we have the health is properly presented in the climate change agenda. I don't think there is no, there is no two ways about it. This is something that has to be done in the immediate. Thanks, Jackie. So awareness raising through the media, effective partnerships and making sure the health dimension remains on the agenda. Thank yes. you. Um, Claire, over to you. What are some of the most effective solutions that you've seen through your work? Thank you so much, Rachel, for that question. Uh, and I do agree with that with Jackie that effective partnerships are actually critical uh, as, as solutions towards the climate crisis. The other thing that I would like to add on is that I'm supporting local initiatives. Most of the times, um, the initiatives that are carried out at, at the grassroots level are disregarded. And I, I fail to understand why they're disregarded as either not effective or they are just put on paper but not implemented on the ground. And that's quite unfortunate because most of the solutions that are done at the community level are actually critical in making sure that the communities either adapt or are able to mitigate the impacts of the climate of the climate crisis. The other thing that I would think I, I would, in my opinion, would work is having rich countries. They made a pledge that they would contribute about a hundred billion dollars towards supporting the developing countries adapt to the impacts of climate crisis. It's critical to say that the developing countries contribute very uh, minimal amounts of greenhouse gas emissions as compared to what the rich countries contribute. And so if these countries through the Green, Green Climate Fund are able to contribute these amounts to help communities and to help countries adapt to the impacts of climate crisis, that would be a needful solution because we can sit here and talk and say we say how we're going to um, implement this and this but without funds that is not going to happen and without also the political goodwill because most of these discussions are politically driven the un discussions the cop 26 discussions are politically driven so we have to look at how do we have the African leaders speaking for the African people? We don't want African leaders speaking for the agendas of the West. We want them speaking about what benefits the African people. What are some of the solutions that are being implemented on the ground within Africa that can actually work for us? We don't want someone telling our stories. We don't want people telling our stories, African stories of the impact of the climate crisis on the African people. We want we as African people to tell the stories just like Jackie is doing with the publication. We want to tell our own stories. What are our impacts? These are some of the solutions that we see working when we can tell our own stories with our own voices. People then are able to, to relate. I, for instance, cannot speak about the UK because I'm not a, a national of the UK, but I can categorically speak about Kenya because I'm a Kenyan national and I know the impacts of the climate crisis on, on, the, on the local communities. So we need to give local communities a voice. Yes, we are starting to consider them, but we need to let them speak out 
more often on what they are doing and from those solutions that they are implementing at the local level, how can we amplify them? We don't want to carry agendas of the West. We want African agendas that work to solve the climate crisis for the African people. What you say about community-owned solutions really resonates with Five Talents. We often see that members in our savings groups they do have they do have their own solutions. They know what issues affect them, um, and they can address them. So ensuring there's community ownership of the solutions and community voices are heard. Ensuring African leaders uh, can represent the needs of their own countries, um, and ensuring that the richer nations do contribute the finance that's required. Thank you. And finally, Philip, over to you. What are, what are the best solutions that you've seen? Um, basically, I might not have anything unique more than what Claire and Jackie have said already. And uh, in a nutshell, it's just to say, let's be our brothers and sisters keeper. Wherever you are, whether you're in the USA, whether you're in Africa, in India, everywhere, we need to be our brother's keeper. And those rich countries, if they can be their brothers, keeper and sisters keeper like African continent, then it's very possible if they pledge to give $100 billion to support this. It's a matter of just easy and channeling the funds to help enable this. As we're talking to you, I have really, really followed closely Jackie talking about how people are dying of very, very petty diseases in 21st century. Uh, uh, Jackie is talking, uh, Claire is talking about malnutrition, which is happening in real life in 21st century. It's something that's supposed to be of the past. So if the, we are uh, taking the initiative of being our brothers and sisters keeper, it's a matter of just simply sharing the resources because the resources are there, the ability is there, it's just the reluctancy and lack of uh, a consistency whereby this this five years we shall see maybe in Kenya we saw proactive and active in matters environment but come the next government the next regime no one cares uh, allow me use a good example with the government that was led by Trump Donald and the government that is being led by Biden you can see the difference the previous regime never cared about environment now the new regime is really caring about environment and all that matters so the political win if we got the brother keeper, forget about the political, the, the race and whatever, we're gonna go places. And this is the right time, just as Jack has said, those uh, initiatives can be supported and be funded. And I'm telling you, this can be a matter of history and forgotten. Thank you so much. Thank you, Philip. I guess political will does come from the people. So what you say about all of us needing to step up and vocalise what needs to happen and take action ourselves is, is really key. Thank you all so much for such a fascinating discussion. We have uh, less than 10 minutes left now for your questions. I think Megan has received two or three in the chat box. So Megan, would you like to um, read out the questions and perhaps allocate them to, uh, to our speakers? Yeah, that's fine. Um, sorry, everyone, we're not going to get to all of your questions today. There have been quite a few, um, but there have been some good discussions in the chat from what I can see. Um, and we're really appreciative for everyone being here this morning to talk to us. Um, so let me pull up the first question. I'm going to send this one to um, Jackie, I think, if that's all right with her. Um, so Jackie, one of our guests today has said that given the way the West has dealt with the, the COVID crisis, in particular uh, vaccine hoarding, um, how can you all in Africa lead in addressing climate crisis so that we can have, um, so that we can save not only Africa, but, but other, other people across the world? Sorry, can you come again with that question? I, I didn't hear you at the point. Hello, Megan. Hi, Jackie. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, I did. <laughs> I, I was I was struggling to hear. Sorry. I see. Really okay. Yes. Yeah, so, okay. So that's okay. okay. Um, one one of our guests has yes. asked. Um, okay. Given the way that the West has dealt with uh COVID, uh in particular vaccine hoarding, um, how can you all in Africa lead in addressing climate crisis? Yes, like. Like we are really doing, we we don't even have enough funds. There's no much political will to do this. The best, I think, people that have really been fighting for change are usually the NGOs, the environmental activists. We have the journalists, 
or the media that are really pushing for this because we feel that most times if we don't push for this the political the, the politicians don't act on it and that's the best way we know we can do it we just have to continue pushing continue making sure that we're influencing policy making that we continue to have discussions that will mitigate the effects of climate change in all sectors of the health and culture so we have to continue continuously talk about it and continuously seek for points. There are things, you know, we just can't do it alone. You know, we have a problem of leadership in Africa. So it's quite hard because it's as though the poor people are not the center. So the best way, the people they talk to, they, we have community leaders, we have NGOs, that's, and the media really, that's how, you know, we relate to these people. So we are like, in, we are like the middlemen between them and the government. And they listen to us, so we just have to make sure that we continue to raise awareness and raise support and connect, network, connect them with the people that matter to make sure that this, there, there are solutions about for climate change crisis. Great, thank you so much, Jackie. I'm going to throw the next question over to Claire. Um, Claire, you've already talked a little bit about um, deforestation uh, and, and foreign investment. So someone's asked, um, rather than, than investing in deforestation, could corporates and foreign investments have a more positive role? What would that possibly look like? Thank you so much, Megan, for that question. Um, investments that are aside from deforestation could be investments um, in uh, agroforestry programs, identifying an area that has been um, deforested and investing in it. And uh, aside from that, we can also look at other possibilities of, of investment. So if, if you're looking at um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, so are we going to invest in agroecology? We have several facets of agroecology. We've got organic farming, we've got permaculture. Are we going to say that now this investments we have as a, as a country, for instance, the UK, we're going to direct 10% uh, 10, 10 or 20% of our, of our budget towards agroecology with the aim that we minimize carbon emissions from the soil. So we know that agroecology helps to conserve the carbon in the soil. So are we going to do that? Are we going to channel this amount of, of our budgetary allocation towards agroforestry programs or reforestation programs? Or is the UK going to pull out of any, of any investments or deals that it had or agreements that it had that, that were around um, logging or any, any you know, activities that are involved that are entail cutting down of trees within the major forest. So there are a myriad of investments that are a myriad of opportunities um, in investments around renewable energy, around uh, afforestation, reforestation, around agroecology. I, I could go on and on, the list is, is endless. Great, thank you, Claire, so much. Um, the next question I have is going to be for Philip. Uh, let me pin you to the screen so everyone can see. Um, Philip, there is one of, one of our guests has said um, that yes, climate change is of course uh, shifting weather patterns, um, but that there have been other sort of underlying issues um, that have affected Africa and other regions of the world for a long time. And they were wondering if building uh, relatively simple water retention schemes um, could help reduce uh, erosion or um, help with unpredictable rainfall. What uh, what do you think? Um, what I'm thinking about that is very common. Uh, soil erosion, of course, it can be controlled by planting of trees and building of gabions, which is doable. But now you get like uh, in situations and places where these are required, the people doesn't have the manpower. The people doesn't have the energy to to like, let's say the funds to buy stones, buy the, the wire mesh and uh, raise gabions. Trees, you can get trees, yes, but transporting them to the places. So it means it's a, a matter of also funding and uh, it can be done, yes, but uh, we need that support. Let's say we need support. As we're talking to you, just travel like around uh, 
600 and maybe 30 something kilometers to come to a place where it's not my home, but I'm just concerned about the environment part of it. So my, my desire is uh, even if you guys could fly from UK and come plant 5,000 trees here, and we can do the same thing, come over there and as long as we support it. I'm pretty sure Jack would like to do that. Ario would like to do that. Claire would like to do that. And we keep on building this community. Thank you so much. Thanks, Philip. Um, I'm going to ask one final question to the panelists because it is 9.30 and we like to uh, keep these events to just an hour. Um, so I'm going to ask each of you in, in one sentence, possibly, um, to tell us what you think we could do in the UK um, to support your work and to support um, climate justice. Uh, Philip, would you like to answer us first? Yes, yes, thank you so much. Uh, UK, UK, let's say if I was to compare UK relationship or bilateral relationship between UK and Kenya, we have, I think we've, we've started a long way ago, almost a hundred years now. And uh, we can't run away from the fact that our, our forefathers had issues with your forefathers, but today we are mending that by even making climate better. And what I can say is uh, what we need to do, you guys, you're blessed. You have more than enough. You have, what you can do is simply run more of fundraising there, get the cash, support Africa, support Kenya, support Nigeria, support Rwanda, support these countries are here. And before I finish, this is a faith-based organization, if I am not wrong. And uh, you can see, I don't know whether Muslims are represented, Buddhists, whoever, you know. So my desire is bring the guys in UK together, tell them we can support Africa, what they need is cash, follow up on the process and procedures. Let's maintain the consistency. And this is very, very much doable. Thank you. Thanks, Philip. Um, Jackie, would you mind answering the same question? I think, I think that there is a, very, a good symbiotic relationship and um, investments investments we, we, we I, I don't think there's anything we can do without money without funds that's very paramount if we have to focus on taking action to reducing climate change so we need to find a way to continuously as i'll always say put this in the front burner is it is a burning topic and we all live here on earth and it's, it, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter who is doing more it's just that we all have to make sure that it is done. Great, thank you, Jackie. Claire, would you mind answering the same question as well? Thank you so much, Rachel. The first thing I would say is less talk, more action. Because we talk a lot. We will have so many of those meetings and, and we'll talk about what needs to be done. But very little will actually be implemented on the ground where the effort is, is really needed. The other thing, second thing is supporting the initiatives that are, being, that are being carried out by the local communities, but those affected by the climate crisis. For instance, Five Talents is working with local communities. So you're working with local communities in Tanzania, you're working with local communities in Kenya. It's supporting those initiatives and not just supporting them financially, but then also amplifying this initiative so that the rest of the world can actually see that we have this community, we have this Maasai community in Kenya. They are pastoralists, but they have been affected by the climate crisis, but they are doing something else. Probably they are planting drought resistant grass that is helping them feed their cattle during the prolonged periods of drought. So how then do we amplify that? How do we use the channels that we have? Each of us on this call here has a network that they can reach. If we made it a point to amplify some of the strategies that are being done by the local communities, then other people would know what is happening in Kenya, what is happening in Tanzania, what is happening in Nigeria. And people would begin to support for those ones who, 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 who these strategies align with their thoughts or you know, with their ambitions. So the three things that I, 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 um, I critically say that we should do is let's talk more action. Like when we talk about 
supporting co local communities. Let that be implemented. Let it reflect on the ground. When we support these initiatives, we encourage communities to actually do more because they see there's the goodwill, there's the organizational goodwill, there's the individual goodwill towards their actions, towards their strategy. So they are compelled to do more. And then lastly, I just, just amplify. If it means taking a picture of this and, and sharing it on, on your social media channels and just writing a beautiful story about what is happening in this other side of the world and let the story be as it is happening. We don't want the story to portray as Africans as victims or as beggars, no. We want it to be portrayed as it is happening, like we are adapting to the climate crisis. We are using our ingenuity to come up with strategies to help us adapt to the climate crisis. Not that Africans are dying or Africans are suffering from you know, malnutrition, no. Let it be that we are coming up with strategies to adapt to what is affecting us, which is the climate crisis. Great, thank you so much to all three of you for, for being here. Um, I'm just gonna throw it to Rachel now to wrap us up. Um, sorry everyone for keeping you just a few minutes late, um, but we had a really lovely discussion today and I'm so thankful that uh, Claire and Jackie and Philip could be with us. Mine is simply to echo those thanks. Huge thank you to all of you for joining today and a massive thank you to our speakers. Normally at the end of these events, I um, say a few words to tie the, the, what the speakers have said back to five talents. I think on this occasion, A, we've no time, but B, that's actually not necessary because everything they have said has been enormously relevant to five talents. Our members experience the effects of climate change every day. It is on all of us um, to do what we can in our own countries, but also to continue supporting community groups to raise their own voices, to implement their own solutions. Um, we're really grateful that Five Talents has a small part in that and grateful to all of you for your support. Um, but as we know, we all need to do more. So on that note, let me wish you all a very good day and a huge thanks again to our speakers.